Hey, you're gonna love this interview with Marco Popic. He is a partner and chief strategist at the Clock Tower Group. He's the author of Geopolitical Alpha, and in this conversation, we talk about the US and China rivalry, Turkey, his constraints framework, and how to get into a geopolitical analysis career. Tons of good stuff, enjoy. Well, Marco, thanks for coming on the show, man. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. Absolutely, same here, real pleasure. So I wanna start off um, just explaining for folks um, specifically the, the role that you play at the Clock Tower Group, maybe a little context of the Clock Tower G- Group generally. And then we can kind of move into this really, really good book here, Geopolitical Alpha, the concept, the, the impetus behind it. Uh, but to start off, what's the kind of role you play in this financial firm? Sure. So I'm a, I'm a partner and a chief strategist at uh, an alternative investment management firm. Uh, We're based in Santa Monica, California. And what we do is we specialize in turning macro big picture ideas into, um, you know, relatively illiquid alternative investment strategies. So those would be, for example, seeding macro hedge funds or investing in early stage fintech companies uh, around the world. We just launched a fund dedicated to Latin America in that particular um, sphere. And also uh, we have interesting businesses in China where we're also taking our approach to seeding macro hedge funds and we're taking that to China. Uh, So most people, when they think of macro investors, they think of investors that deal with, you know, public markets that trade copper or dollar, um, these kind of big asset classes. Um, We also think about big ideas, but we didn't articulate it in these kind of illiquid strategies. And mostly, if, if, if folks are trying to wrap their head around the client that you're serving, it is the capital allocators at some form of a large institution, be that an endowment or, or, or some sort of you know, a pension system or something like that? Yeah, so it would be institutional investors, exactly what you're uh, describing. And that's because you know, um, you know, retail investors are not going to uh, have the patience and the mandate for something as exotic as these illiquid strategies. But also um, in the US in particular, uh, there's a lot of family offices that would uh, be the kind of investors that would do this. And family offices, of course, are high net worth individuals that have uh, basically an office managing their assets. Uh, They would also be interested in, in private allocation or illiquid allocation. Gotcha. So the, the reason I was so excited to have you on, as we've discussed, you know, previous to the recording, I really enjoyed the book, Geopolitical Alpha, and outside the context of how someone might know me professionally, which is, you know, we're helping people with media production and marketing, my kind of um, intellectual recreation is usually around geopolitics. Um, And so being able to come at the world of investing with this geopolitical lens Um, is a a very kind of interesting intersection of ideas that we explore on the show and just uh, perhaps a framework that people aren't as used to incorporating into their investing strategy. Maybe they'll say, hey, I'm going to go into emerging markets or I'm going to have a US centric index fund that I'm investing in. Um, But really having to um, have a, a, a sharp edge to the tools with which they are evaluating the geopolitical changes of the day is becoming increasingly more relevant. I think that's why you wrote the book. That's why you've kind of found yourself in this position. Can you talk a little bit, uh, maybe give you a little bit of the history lesson as to why that's becoming so salient? And then we can kind of move into the constraints framework that you're using. Yeah, sure. Well, I think <clears throat> what's happening, I mean, first of all, someone with my background and my skill sets and my methodological bias would likely not have a job in finance, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And that's not entirely true. Um, macro hedge funds have always been very sensitive to politics and geopolitics. Uh, but for sort of run in the mill, you know, investors usually did not have to concern themselves with these uh, issues. And why is that? It's very simple because we adopted, um, the West adopted a set of policies, a set of best practices uh, that had to do with macroeconomic policy. So, for example, fiscal policy should be counter-cyclical. That means you only really stimulate when there's a recession. 
or monetary policy became very orthodox, very focused on you know, a preemptive rise in interest rates at the first sign that the economy is overheating. Uh, free trade you know, became kind of a best practice. Uh, laissez-faire economic system, where the government takes a back seat to regulation or industrial policy. All of these were really established in the 80s. And this is a really important period of time because the 1980s saw the world uh, leave a very turbulent decade where inflation had overshot uh, expectations, where policy was largely incoherent. There was a lot of unorthodoxy that led to suboptimal outcomes. You know, we had very uh, high rates of inflation throughout the 1970s. And so the way to curb that, of course, Paul Volcker raised interest rates, which is a very foundational moment for many people's careers in finance. Um, and at that point, 1980s saw this adoption of these best practices that many economists and journalists and kind of professors have dubbed the Washington Consensus. Um, that was a really, really important moment in history. And then from 85 to 90, the Soviet Union collapses. So as the West is adopting these policies of capitalism, the alternative, which is institutionalized socialism and, cap and communism, collapses. And so then the rest of the world says, well, which, which system worked? We'll take the Washington Consensus. And that's when the IMF and the World Bank starts propagating this set of best practices around the world. Um, so what's changed? What's changed is that those best practices after 2008, after the uh, great financial crisis, and after this year, uh, have been brought into question. And that means that fundamentally, the government got pushed aside by those best practices, the role of government in finance and economics. Uh, it's coming back. And that's where politics and geopolitics are now again essential uh, to being an investor and not just a fancy hedge fund trader, but like if you're an investor, you have to have some understanding of politics and geopolitics. And the framework that you introduce in the book, you talk about it being a constraints-based framework and on all sorts of you know previous conversations we've had on the show, we've talked about constraints. It's very familiar probably to the people listening to this, but usually in the context of their business. So you know it's hard to find the marginal, uh, additional talented person to employ, or cash flow, or distribution for their message, or all these things that small business owners are very very accustomed to having to negotiate. It's all constraints informed. Um, can you talk, you know, that's more of like a micro level. Can you talk about when we take that up to a macro level and evaluate a nation state, um, how that same idea of constraints is applied to um, these much, much larger entities? You know, uh, I'll, I'll explain it from a different perspective uh, that I don't think I've ever really used to explain this before. Um, there's really two sets of groups of people who analyze geopolitics. There's policymakers like, who are in the game. They're within the same realm. And so they rarely think of constraints because it's a little bit like ego deflating. You, know? um, you overlook constraints in other policymakers because you don't want to believe them yourself. So, and what this means is that it very rarely is an intelligence agency of a sovereign nation state going to say, ah, don't worry about it. You know, they're constrained. Um, they focus a lot on what policymakers want to do, what politicians want to do. So if you go to um, an, a former member of the intelligence world or a former politician, they're rarely going to talk to you about what they can't do because they've spent their whole lives trying to overcome that. And, you know, like, like that's why we elect many of these people. That's why we hired them so that they can do better than their constraints. And so they're wired in a certain way. Then on the other side, you have the investment community. That when, when the investment community tries to approach geopolitics, um, again, because the last 40 years were so clear for many investors what they needed to learn, and they get basically needed to get a CFA, they needed to know how to value things, you know, mathematically. Like it became very a mathematical routine kind of a job that very few of them really looked at geopolitics and politics in a systematic way. And so they started to think of geopolitics as a realm of voodoo, where you got to go and find a former politician to tell you what's happening. You know? And so you have this real mismatch in cultures, where on one hand, investors are extremely systematic, framework-driven, objective, quantitative. But when they're faced with geopolitics and politics, they suddenly become like chicken entrail readers. You know? and, they, and they visit these websites, and I don't want to name, 
but are really, really subpar in the kind of information they're giving you. It's basically conspiracy theories. And I found this really fascinating when I joined the financial industry. I was like, really? Like, you read this crappy blog to find out what's going on in the world, and yet you're so focused on systematic, framework-driven approaches in finance? That was bizarre to me. And so what I settled on is just focusing on constraints because they're observable, they're quantifiable. And because in my experience, um, you know, preferences are both, you know, optional and subject to constraints, whereas constraints are neither optional nor subject to preferences. And that goes back to your example, which is like, if you're running a business, you can wish to have more cash flow to hire more people. You can desire it, but that's your preference. The reality is the constraint, and then you operate within those constraints. And that is a tool for forecasting politicians, policymakers, um, as good as we have available to us. Yeah, I would love the uh, Nike advertising and marketing budget, but just because I want it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be able to come into being. Exactly. So uh, just to maybe get a little bit more specific, and, and then I kind of want to go around the world with you and talk about the kind of practical application of this framework to a couple different um, elements of geopolitics. Some of these constraints might be, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, the, the general kind of sentiment of voters. So it doesn't matter if you want to do something wildly to one extreme left or right. Um, if there's kind of a, a, a median voter or the, the average um, consensus of the voters, you can't stray too far from that without exposing yourself to real risk in uh, non-authoritarian authoritarian dictatorships. There's um, the, the core geography of the country. There's the demographics, how old or young and the general skill. What, what other kind of constraints when you're looking at a country, not that you're not going to discover a new country necessarily, but when you come to it, analyzing a country, what are the main things that you're honing in on? You know, it really depends on the question you're trying to answer. Um, so if, if I'm trying to forecast whether like Russia is going to militarily invade Ukraine again, you know, there's one set of constraints specific to that issue. Uh, if you're trying to uh, forecast whether India is going to be able to do pro-business um, structural reforms, there's a, set, there's a different set um, of, of constraints. And the book kind of like, as you list yourself, the, good, the book goes through all of these. Um, and I give uh, empirical examples. I give examples of how these constraints work in, in, in reality. I guess what I would say for listeners of this podcast, though, I would just kind of like bring it back, um, back to the kind of like big picture and simply simplify it to this. If you can measure it, it's a constraint. You know, if you have to read a book about some politician's views, it's not a constraint. So I'll give you an example of this, like 2016, 2017. Uh, I went and I was working in what's called sell side research. I was working at a different firm and I was producing research for investors. And so I would go on these road shows where you go and you basically pitch your, your wares, your, your views and ideas. And I went to Asia, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, China, Tokyo. And I, we were talking about the trade war and everyone told me, nah, we're good. We're not worried. Okay. You're not worried about the trade war. Why is that? Well, because we read The Art of the Deal, the book that, you know, Donald Trump wrote, and we know what's going to happen. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Like, we're good. And I was like, oh, really? So you read a book, and that makes you feel confident that Trump is not going to pursue a significant trade war. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not really serious. He's just, you know, they're trying to get a little bit of better terms. And I was like, yeah, this isn't about his preferences. The median American had moved against laissez-faire economics had moved against free trade and we had the data to back this up this wasn't about trump's preferences he was simply a political vessel for the american median voter to express their desire to have basically you know a, a much more confrontational view a much less openly globalist uh, policies and you know he was just the right person for the right time uh, but this kind of like a nonchalant well don't worry about it there'll be a little bit of a scuffle and he'll get a deal with china like turned out to be really wrong. We were headed for a recession even before COVID, largely because the animal spirits had sapped from the economy. You could see this through numerous of indicators because the trade war had been much more significant than people thought. Uh, and that's a great example of how even the smartest people who make a lot of money and they have great education overemphasize the ephemeral, the qualitative. And it really reminds me of that scene from the movie Moneyball 
Uh, I don't know if there's any fans of Moneyball here, but when Billy Bean is sitting around surrounded by these octogenarian, uh, you know, baseball scouts who are talking about baseball players based on these completely qualitative indicators, like this ball player, player is not going to be good because he has an ugly girlfriend. That's literally a scene in the movie. And you're just like, wait, what does that have to do with how, oh, it shows a lack of confidence, you know, like, okay, maybe that flew in 1963. But that is a non-diagnostic variable. And you will be surprised how many people in positions of serious power who manage a lot of assets make the same kind of statements about politics. It's just not systemic, no framework, just I read a book or I read a blog. Yeah, uh, speaking of the ephem ephemeral, at least to me, it feels like there is a new headline or, or something associated with um, the Strait of Taiwan and some ship sailing through um, and that being basically pointed to as the potential flashpoint or hot point associated with rising tensions between the US and China. Um, but at the same time, one, one thing you did a really great job in the book of talking about was the actual constraints of popular consensus that still affects the Chinese Communist Party, despite uh, a, a less sophisticated person looking at the, well, the, they're a single party, they've got no competition. Why would they have to worry about uh, public sentiment? But can maybe you uh, bring the constraints framework specifically to um, tensions in Taiwan and the, uh, you're, you're never going to say concretely, but the likelihood of things escalating there in some way, shape or form? Although I would, I would you know, like, uh, this is what I have to do for a living. So I, I would say overtly what what the probabilities are. I mean, I think um, I would say the probabilities of conflict between U.S. and China, um, or let's say crisis, some sort of a crisis, you know, Berlin crisis, Berlin airlift crisis, or Cuban missile crisis are good analogies. I think the probability over the next six months is is actually quite high. I would say about 20%, which is significant. You know, that's that's like a, basically a one in, in five chance that we have some, some uh, crisis that is derived from the, the, the tensions in the Straits of Taiwan or, or just South China Sea and so on. Uh, why is this? Well, because I think China is adjusting to a new America. And, you know, um, I think it was relatively easy for Beijing to, um, to, to you know, like interpret the, the, the Trump administration as an anomaly. But now that the Biden administration is doubling down on many of the same sort of pieces of rhetoric, but actually making it even more uncomfortable for China by stressing human rights and stressing geopolitics, which Trump didn't really do until 2020, it, it, it's, it's going to cause a period of adjustment. And uh, China is adjusting to this new rhetoric and strategy, this reality that the US and China are indeed rivals. Uh, and so in the near term, I would say the probability of a crisis is, is elevated, but I think it will dissipate and then we'll have this interregnum. So once we pass the first six months of adjusting to a new administration, I think U.S. and China will settle into some sort of, you know, more stable equilibrium. And then only in the longer term can the probability of conflict rise again um, if if China does manage to you know, rival the US in terms of raw geopolitical power. So it's a U-shaped probability. Now, why does it dip? Why doesn't it just increase linearly? Well, because of the constraints that I think um, many commentators are just completely ignoring. And there's two sets of constraints. One is a mega constraint, which is the fact that we don't exist in a world where only China and the US matter. There's other countries with significant independence in pursuing their foreign and economic policy. And you might say, well, I mean, that's always the case. Well, no, it's not. In 1945, I can tell you there were only two countries on the planet that mattered. There was Moscow and there was Washington, D.C. Nobody else got asked anything. Uh, you know, like the U.S. sort of like kindly asked London and Paris what they thought, but not ser in a serious way. In fact, when France and the United Kingdom tried to pursue an independent foreign policy, in the Suez crisis, uh, they were threatened by the U.S. to back off because it was causing problems in its relationship with the Soviet Union. So the bipolar nature of the Cold War is something that's unlikely to be replicated. The U.S. and the Soviet Union had incredible hold on their allies. Um, I wouldn't even call them allies. They were really vassal states. You know, NATO and the Warsaw Pact were not alliances of equals. They were... 
you know, there was the center and then the periphery. Today, China and the U.S. are nowhere near the same level of power in relative terms. And that means that the constraint on the two of them carving up the whole world is that their own allies are not going to abide by their uh, policies. So imagine a world where the U.S., for example, said, OK, you know what, we're going to stop trading with China. You know, a Commerce Department says to Boeing, hey, no more selling airplanes to China. What's going to happen? Like, is Airbus going to follow the United States? Of course not. There's no way. France is going to say like, oh, that's a cool story. We're going to go and sell them more now airplanes. Yes, that's awesome. And this is, by the way, what happened in the 19th century. Precisely the same dynamic happened. And you had this world where uh, Germany continued to trade with the UK, France, and Russia because those three countries couldn't coordinate on these matters on their own. So that's the first constraint. The second constraint is what you alluded to, which is China itself is constrained in being extremely assertive. Um, a lot of the you know, policies that are emanating from Beijing suggest that they're moving towards a more consumer-based society. And one of the reasons, economy, consumer-based economy. And the reason they want to do that is they want to become more independent. They don't want to rely on American consumer demand for economic growth, but that's going to take time. And last year and this year, uh, it's exports that have led the recovery in China. The household spending has actually been uh, hit quite a bit. China did not stimulate its economy the way we did. There were no stimulus checks kind of flowing into the Chinese economy. And so if China wants to have economic stability, it's going to have to play ball with the rest of the world because the end consumer, the final demand is still external to its economy, even as its exports, a share of GDP have fallen. Uh, so China has this real difficult uh, balance. It's not ready yet to become you know, fully assertive. Um, and I think a lot of the commentary, especially in the US, um, overstates uh, both Chinese assertiveness and its ability to be as aggressive as people think it will be. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. As, as you talked about those different analogies, um, you know, thinking Cold War and vassal states either uh, aligned with the Soviet Union or the U.S. I almost thought more like American football, where there's kind of the head coach and everyone is just pieces on the head coach's board in terms of where they might move. And this multipolar environment where there's maybe two stars, if, if you want to call China and U.S. the stars, uh, but all these other capable independent actors, more like a basketball game where maybe, you know, things rotate around the Steph Curry or the LeBron or what have you. But, you know, some guy might just decide to go off and do their own thing and, and throw the entire game out of whack just because they have that autonomy. You know what? Like, listen, I'm a sucker for sports analogies, as you know, like you yeah. planned, like I can tell the book is full of them. Some of them are funny, I think. Uh, so I would say that, uh, you know, soccer is a really good example of what we're talking about. You know, like I think basketball is perhaps a poor analogy itself, although I see the whole co uh, coach point. Basketball is just like five, five dudes with a ball, you know? So like one person really does make a big difference in basketball, but um, soccer, like you can be the best soccer player in the world as Messi has been for the last, you know, like 10, 15 years. And yet you cannot really contribute to your team as much as a Michael Jordan or as a coach in football. And that's the world we're in today. It's a world where the U.S. is going to have to work to get its allies on board on a number of different things. And I think one of the things that you've seen American commentators really try to stress is the threat of China. And the problem with that is twofold. One, Japan has been living next to China, I think, forever, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I mean, Tokyo is sitting there and listening to Biden and Trump and like, really, you know, like, that's really cool story. Yeah, we've been dealing with this for a very long time. So Japan is actually quite pr pragmatic, even after some serious confrontations with China that almost did lead to blows like in 2011 and 12 over the uh, Diaoyu Senkaku Islands. You know, Japan has continued to trade and invest in China. Look, I'll bite at a lower trajectory, but... Japan has, has learned to live with a very powerful uh, and assertive China. And so they're not going to freak out over that overnight because suddenly America tells them to. And then you have on the other side, uh, Europe, which is so far away from China. You know, I see some of these commentators in the U.S. talking about debt traps and so on. And a lot of this stuff is just honestly nonsense. 
Um, no one, <laughs> like no one in Eastern Europe, is worried about becoming indebted to China and then China showing up with a gunboat and seizing factories. Um, and Ch Europe is so far away that you know there's obviously concerns about property rights, intellectual property, about technology theft, all those things. But for Europe, Japan, even South Korea, um, this this new kind of verbiage out of America is just difficult to agree with. Uh, in other words, China would have to do a lot more to prove uh, the U.S. correct in the eyes of the rest of the world. And that's why coordination against China is going to be much different from coordination against the Soviet Union. And so that would kind of lead into uh, people very familiar with NATO as this kind of uh, way of trying to block in the Soviet Union. And there's this similar noise made about the Quad, India, Australia, Japan, the U.S. kind of coming together to try to form a similar type of um, containment to China generally, and you would just say that that's not really going to operate in a similar way? No, uh, no way. I mean, you know, like NATO has, has a mutual defense clause, uh, which is triggered automatically. Um, Quad is nowhere near being that kind of a level of a military alliance. And so I think, I think it's just going to take a lot more time, and it would, it would require China to, to make some severe mistakes in terms of foreign policy. So it's not impossible. Uh, for example, trying to uh, reunify with Taiwan militarily would certainly accelerate some of these efforts. And then I think that would, that would change my, uh, my view considerably. Um, but uh, short of that, I mean, it's just, you know, there's, there's no level of threat that's I equivalent. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, the Soviet Union had something like 70 tank divisions ready to burst through the Falda Gap and take Frankfurt in like half an hour, you know? And there was actually no way conventionally, at least this was the thinking at the time, it was later revealed to have been perhaps a little too alarmist, but the conventional view in the 60s, 70s and 80s was that there was no way to uh, prevent a conventional war against the Soviet Union. There was like no way to stop them. And so the United States did not have a no first use policy towards nuclear weapons. Why? Because it planned to use them in Europe to stop Soviet attack with tactical nuclear weapons, which were positioned throughout the European continent. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, was very magnanimous, and they said, no, 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 we will never use first because we don't need to. You know, we'll be in Paris in a week. And so this was like not some sort of a theoretical threat. Oh, one day China will have dominance of 5G, and then they'll spy on our kids through TikTok, and then our kids will be brainwashed. You know, like, no, 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 no. There was a tank, a Soviet tank, like, over there. You could see it, and it was going to come over here. And so that's where NATO was born. You know, so, like, the equivalence here is, is, is honestly, like, comical. I'll give you another one. There were parties, like, political parties in Europe, in Paris, in Rome, in 1940s and 50s that owed their allegiance to Moscow. You know, so like uh, this wasn't, again, academic. This was actual parties owing loyalty to an enemy. And, you know, the Communist Party of France, Communist Party of, of Italy, like look it up. They didn't win elections, but they won like 20, 30 percent of the vote. So today, you know, people, um, you know, freak out about China, like, uh, you know, using money in different ways to influence people. Of course, that's happening. Of course. But the level of like espionage and influence was, was much different. In fact, that's why the U.S. launched the Marshall Plan to ensure that Italy and France did not turn towards communism as their operating system um, in, the, in the late 1940s and 1950s. And so uh, Europeans who understand history and have experienced these, these geopolitical tensions, it's just going to be very difficult to convince the Italian government that there's this existential risk um, well, when it comes to China, it's, it's basically it's going to be impossible. It's going to be impossible to show up in Rome as a member of the U.S. State Department and say, like, look, China's like critical. You need to uh, stop trading with them. It's just not it's literally not going to happen. Trump didn't uh, succeed. Biden won. And that's going to then create a constraint on American policymakers in how much they can really deleverage from their own relationship with China. Um, now, this doesn't mean the war doesn't happen, though. This is something very important. It sounds like I'm pretty dovish. It sounds like I think that world's going to basically just sing Kumbaya. The problem with that is that I'm absolutely historically empirically correct. 
it's like the argument is practically un unassailable. But my example from the 19th century, how did it end up? Yes, Germany traded with the UK, with France and Russia, right up until summer of 1914, and then it went to war with it. So that's something to just keep in mind that, you know, you can still have these nonlinear outcomes, even for the, even if for the next five to 10 years, um, you know, there may not be economic bifurcation between the U.S. and China. And that's something to keep in mind. So I want to spin around the globe again and touch on a couple of things you've said. So there's these um, very capable other independent actors around the globe. And there's another country that has been a part of NATO, uh, but has kind of been up to their own stuff, which is Turkey. And to me, this is, at least in my reading of the news or my perception as an American um, the, the mo biggest blind spot generally for um, Americans, just in terms of influential actors elsewhere on the globe, um, you know, there's all the, all the drama in the mid, mid, Middle East with Iran. Obviously, we talked about China and have an awareness of world, uh, you know, Europe because of learning about World War II somewhat in uh, our history classes. I, I, it seems like an enormous blind spot. I, I, I candidly don't even really know who I would talk to in my life about uh, Turkey in some way, shape or form. So can you kind of uh, take us from like a rudimentary level up to the constraints and the challenges that Turkey's facing? I mean, wow, Turkey's facing a lot of different cross currents. Uh, I think Turkey is facing one of the largest mismatches between uh, what it uh, aspires to do and what its actual capabilities are. And so, you know, Turkey has a pretty advantageous geographical position between two key continents. It had great economic relationship with countries like Syria and Iraq, to which it provides a lot of services, a lot of, uh, you know, manufactured and consumer goods. Uh, so um, it has a potential to be a pretty significant, you know, um, hub of technological consumer manufacturing prowess. And it has a lot of potential markets that it could dominate because it understands those markets culturally, linguistically, in case of you know some Central Asian economies and so on. Uh, at the same time, it has a real problem. And that real problem is that um, in terms of energy, it's completely dependent on Russia, more or less. Uh, it has really no, it, it imports massive amounts of oil and natural gas. Um, and then finally, it, it never really managed to integrate itself into the European economy because it did not really satisfy all the kind of political and sociopolitical, you know, rules and, and norms that Europe was asking it to do. Um, and it, the fact that it's so advan advantageous geographically almost is a detriment because it can't decide which sphere of influence to fit into. And it continuously tries to carve out its own before it reaches a certain level of material wealth. Um, and so that's what I would argue has been the problem with the policy of, of uh, Ankara over the past 10 years. It chose to make a bid for a sphere of influence of its own before it was capable of doing so. Um, it abandoned its bid for the European Union, thinking after 2008, 2009, well, the West is declining anyways. Why do we need them? Look at them. You know, they're about to collapse. Uh, we're good on our own. Uh, although those decisions were probably made even earlier than 2008. Um, and he basically struck out on this view, like, well, we're going to carve out our sort of proto, uh, sort of neo-Ottoman sphere of influence that we had in the past, which is really North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, Caucasus, and the Balkans. And the problem with that strategy is that it upset way too many actors, whether it's the United States, whether it's Saudi Arabia in some of its moves uh, after the Arab Spring in Egypt, whether it's Russia. Um, and basically all those attempts to carve out the sphere of influence have largely failed uh, to the detriment of its economy. And it's a really good example of why geopolitical power ultimately rests on material wealth. Uh, you know, Hard, like, and a lot of geopolitical strategists mis mistake this. Um, there's this view that economics is irrelevant or some, some, somehow subservient to geopolitics, to demographics, to geography. And Turkey is just a good example that you can have great geography and just be at the mercy of um, you know, actors around you that have a larger surplus that they can carve out of their economy and dedicate 
to geopolitical endeavors. And so Turkey has just been biting off more than it can chew uh, in a world where other powers still have a lot of interest. That's so funny. Once again, the analogies to like small businesses and startups, the ability to have focus versus kind of spreading yourself too thin on too many projects. You could I'd argue... Yeah, I'd, I'd argue that Uber, um, you know, was guilty of that with some of the endeavors that they've pursued and they're kind of learning that lesson painfully now. Um, I have one other question kind of as we talk about places around the globe, and then I want to talk about this career that you found yourself in, how you got into it, and all that good stuff. Um, there's another idea out there, which is the, the notion of the rise of the city state. Maybe the sterling example of that is a place like Singapore. Um, and, you know, you see a, attempts at this happening um, uh, around the Persian Gulf. And, you know, even the, 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 some hype, at least in like tech startup circles around Miami versus San Francisco and these other types of places. There's, I guess, a somewhat arg- uh, obvious constraint in that these city states uh, usually cannot raise anything resembling a substantial uh, military to defend themselves. However, they do have some really substantial capacity for um, wealth generation. And so I'm curious um, if you kind of buy into that idea of the rise of the city-state narrative, um, or if you could maybe just talk as, as you think about those different types of endeavors, if you see them still as um, either vassals to more powerful entities or, or the ways in which those types of frameworks are constrained. You know, I think every period in history had city-states or neutral places to do business. I don't know how to define it because, you know, some of them are not necessarily cities, but they're like these little enclaves. Um, So I think that I'm not sure that there's anything unique in history to the current uh, moment. Um, There are always places that manage to leverage their relevance um, human capital, geography, and neutrality to the great benefit. You know, so like you think of Singapore today, you can think of Venice as well in the late Middle Ages. Um, you know, so there are examples of this throughout history. Um, you have the Switzerlands of the, of the world. And by the way, Switzerland and, and Singapore have a pretty similar population, even though one is a country, the other one is a city-state. Um, So I don't think there's anything really unique about this. What's interesting is what gives rise to these entities. And I'm not sure that there's anything unique, again, about current conditions. You know, like you could argue that Singapore is very much leveraged to uh, globalization. And you might think that in a world where we have deglobalization or where globalization has kind of reached its apex, maybe we won't have as many city states. But I, I, I I don't think that's the case. I think that you, you will always have uh, places in the world that because of their um, interesting mix of regulation and human capital become, you know, important in some way. So Miami is a really good example uh, because of advantageous taxation, because, um, because of a idiosyncratic really issue that most people probably don't think when they think of Miami. But after 2008, the United States cracked down on financial safe havens um, on places where, you know, you could do tax avoidance, uh, where a lot of wealth was basically hidden, whether it was Switzerland or the Caribbean. And th- ironically, all this money basically flooded back to the U.S., whether, you know, consciously or subconsciously, the U.S. created this incredible uh, effect. And, and a lot of it from the Caribbean and Latin America did go to Miami. And so I would, I would say that was the first step in this latest iteration of Miami, that combined with low corporate tax rate, with interesting, you know, multicultural scene. Um, I think that's given Miami this rise that you're witnessing right now. I think this will always happen. I don't think it's unique to this current uh, period. And, you know, it'll be interesting to find out which ones are the next ones. And, and they do, to some degree, make themselves a target by accruing that wealth and influence, perhaps evidenced by the kind of absorption of, of Hong Kong by China recently, where if you are that kind of... Um, economic driver and, and some particularly powerful geopolitical uh, forces nearby, you, you, you kind of put a target on your back. But I'm not sure that Hong Kong is going to dissipate as in terms of influence. I mean, I've changed my view on this. I've written some reports where I've said it will. I mean, you know, it depends. I actually think, you know, Hong Kong could continue to be relevant, especially in a world where, um, you know, investors want to access China, but they require interlocutors through which to do it. So, 
I understand the argument that China, of course, has, you know, like interest in boosting Shanghai or Guangzhou or Hainan Island. Uh, some of their latest uh, measures are really focused on Hainan, which is really interesting. Maybe that's the next, you know, kind of a city state. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it remains to be seen what happens to Hong Kong. And I think the human capital aspect of this is, is really, really relevant. Uh, I don't think that city states are uh, possible without human capital. And that's what Singapore got right really well. Hey, hope you're enjoying the interview and all that analysis. I know I learned a ton. We're about to hear Marco talk about getting into a geopolitical analysis career. But if you're enjoying it so far, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. We have so many other great interviews on this channel. We drop new ones every single week. Check it out. I do want to spend some time because this is a show that gets categorized as a careers one um, and how you found yourself in this role with the Clock Tower Group. Um, you're very candid in the book about how you kind of had, we're going down the conventional PhD professorship type of track and then have taken all sorts of different diversions. Um, I, I wanted to start basically just talking about your time at Stratford and uh, explaining for a little bit uh, people what Straffer is, was, and um, how you kind of found yourself there. Yeah, so Stratfor, uh is in the political risk um, industry, uh, just like Eurasia Group as well, um, and uh, some of the other firms in that space, um, like Geoquant, Ergo. Um, there's, a, there's a whole industry of political risk analysis. And I was doing my PhD at University of Texas, which is in Austin, and Stratford was headquartered in Austin as well. Um, and so when I got disillusioned with academia and said, well, I should probably learn how to, you know, I should probably have a real job at some point before I decide to go into uh, academia. It was just obvious. It just made a lot of sense. And so I joined it. This industry is not that big. You know, that's what's interesting about it. It's, uh, it's actually really small. And so, you know, getting a foothold in, in the kind of a political risk space is much more difficult than people think. And so um, it doesn't really exist as a profession. And so I was very fortunate to be able to, you know, spend some time at Stratfor and, and learn some of the ins and outs of how one actually, you know, uh, does political risk analysis. And uh, what I found while I was there was that it was kind of useful for a lot of CEOs and a lot of corporates uh, as a background, but I didn't feel like it was really, um, you know, it was nice to have, not a need to have the political kind of analysis that we were doing. And I felt that there was a way to do it in a way where it could actually generate alpha, that's the name of the book, which is returns above a certain benchmark in finance. I felt that there was actually a way to use political analysis to beat the markets in certain, you know, cases. And so that's why I decided to cross over more specifically into finance. But I definitely get a lot of questions all the time from people on LinkedIn or from young people studying international relations and political science. Like, hey, how do you actually enter this industry? And yeah, when you mentioned it being such a small world, I, I didn't even quite realize it when I first um, saw one of your interviews on Real Vision, but you know the Stratfor, that's where Peter Zions come out of, George Friedman. Um, th th it seems like an exceptionally uh, small circle of characters that um, you know have the ears of those decision makers and have done the work to kind of prove that they can make a call. Uh, you can have some confidence in it, know that it's it's well researched. Um, one of the other parts that was interesting to me in, in the intro was. Um, I believe it was your uh, partner there at the Clock Tower Group, Stephen, who said that you were this nihilist. You had this nihilist approach to analysis. Um, and in different interviews, we've kind of talked about that in, in, in a different context, not in geopolitics, as potentially being uh, harmful. But can you talk about how a general nihilism about geopolitical analysis has behooved you um, in this profession? Yeah, and I think that's the, if, I, if there's one thing that I would take from the book and proselytize. It's that we need more nihilists. Now, not in your behavior as a human being, but in your profession. Why? Well, even if you're running an NGO that's trying to fundamentally change the world, you can't be blind to the constraints that face you. You know, and in fact, I think the way to be successful in any endeavor that has to do with the real world, which is messy and doesn't obey Newtonian physics, and so you can't just, you know, outsmart it 
through math. So whenever you're dealing with societies or humans, I think it's really uh, important to separate the analysis from your action and agency. And so uh, I talk a lot about this. I call it aloof indifference. My partner, Steve, calls it nihilism. And I mean, I do too. But the idea behind it is that in order to forecast where the world is going, you need to really wash away all the biases that you have. And that's a really difficult thing to do. And very few places will teach you how to do that. Um, and once you do that, once you can kind of forecast where the world is going, indifference to whether that's good or bad, you know, putting passion aside, only then can you, you know, actually figure out, well, how do I change that? But if you go into the analysis already biased or already focused on changing the world, you're just going to fail, in my view. And you see this a lot. You see this in politics all the time. You have the zealots, the ideologically committed zealots who basically come in and say, well, this is how we're going to do it. And they face opposition because obviously they do. Now, from their own personal self-interest, and many of them won't like, admit this, they're really not trying to change the world. They're just trying to make themselves feel better by kind of washing themselves with their own preconceived biases and, and views. But if you want to change the world, you have to understand the constraints you're operating uh, inside and then try to change those. Um, but that, that starting point of aloof indifference, I think, is most critical in this analysis or really in any endeavor that has to do with you know, human agency. Um, now, <laughs> the reason this is very difficult to acquire is because one, we're humans and we're biased. But the second reason is that, again, the political risk industry is very, very small. So most people who finish international relations or political science or are interested in this, they either go into government, you know, where obviously uh, they don't get trained in nihilism or aloof indifference. <laughs> I mean, it'd be, but I think they should be, you know, uh, but they don't. Or they go and uh, go into kind of the uh, international organization, NGO world, where you definitely don't get instructed on this method, or you go into business or you go into finance, um, where you would think, where you would think that people are instructed in how to think analytically and separate themselves and their own views from their analysis, but they actually don't. And so there's still this kind of indignancy and this kind of a, you know, a judgmental quality, even in finance, to viewing the markets as right or wrong, or what policymakers are doing is stupid. You know, things like that. Then, you know, you, you get faced with this even in finance where it's like, it's not stupid. It just is. So act accordingly. Um, and I think that it's very difficult to train this. How do you train it? I think the way you train it is you try to use empathy a lot in your analysis. And you try to put yourself in the shoes of those who you even really disagree with. This is really critical to becoming desensitized to yourself. And to be able to start looking at concrete data um, and objective facts in forecasting where the world is going. That's where it starts. Well, it sounds like you are, though, optimistic about the ability to train someone towards that, because I would... I would struggle almost with differentiating, you know, the right team culture where leaders and, and, and the, the, the norms have been set that we're all going to, you know, point out each other's biases and kind of correct when someone's being too ideological in a view. That would be one kind of arena where you could hopefully develop other people to operate that way. But then there's also like my mind goes to almost just like, you know, they have the different kind of psychological personality profiles and someone that just is oriented around disagreeableness is going to be much less likely to land in an environment where um, everyone's kind of nodding along. So if you, you kind of have that, that disagreeableness off the bat, you're more comfortable being like, well, that's a ridiculous take. That doesn't have any sort of grounding in the actual facts on the ground. I'm not sure if it matters if you're disagreeable or not. You know, okay. you could maybe even make an argument that disagreeable people are more likely to have a counterintuitive view. Like, I think it comes down to this. I mean, I've, I've worked with disagreeable people and agreeable people who both equally were unwilling to think outside the box. It requires several things. I think one, it requires you to have at some point in your life been the other. I do think you cannot do this without it. It is extremely difficult to have a level of aloof indifference that's required for forecasting the future without having been othered at some point. Whether that means that you grew up in Arkansas and then you landed in Manhattan, like that's good enough for me. I'm not asking for you to live abroad or something like that. 
but you have to have sometimes been out of like out of place because that act of sort of cultural and so- social you know otherness gives you the necessary level of an anal- analytical capability to then understand that everything is relative and how somebody can act on their constraints in a certain way. I think that's that's like the the starting point. You have to have felt it at some point. Or maybe you were born just different. You know, you're a you're a kid in a family full of football fans. You're like you rebelled and you're like ice hockey. Like that's good enough for me. You know, like but the point is that at some point in your life you have to have felt that. Uh, once that's done, then you have to kind of seek it out. Because the the critical point of uh, uh, analyzing societies and then making a difference is being able to forecast correctly policymaker moves um, without thinking that they're stupid or that they're driven by this or that. You know, once you're there, you can then focus on objective facts. And that's why I keep saying, like, even if you're running an NGO that's, you know, focused on climate change, even if you're, even if you're extremely, like, focused on normative and value-driven issues, you can still be pretty nihilist in your analysis right up until the point where you then have to act on your analysis on how to change the world. Right on. Well, my last question before we, we ask our standard ones for wrapping up is precisely the opposite of nihilism. Uh, I, you mentioned being a basketball fan, a soccer fan as well. Where do your fandoms lie and what are your expectations for the 2021 uh, NBA season? Well, I'm a huge Laker fan. I, I had okay. <laughs> this before I could speak English. Um, growing up in Serbia, huge basketball fan. And so I think, you know, the Lakers will probably win again. I guess I'm hopeful of that. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's a great season, and it, it could go either way. That's, that's what's interesting about this. We'll see. Yeah. I'm, if we get a, uh, another KD LeBron showdown in the finals, that would be absolutely stunning. Right? That would be awesome. I think, I think that would be really good. Cool. Um, well, before we ask the senior last two questions, Marco, anything else you were hoping to share today that I just didn't give you a chance to? I guess, uh, you know, one thing I would say just in terms of this, this industry, political risk industry, um, I, I do want to spend maybe just a little bit more time on that because it, I do think it's a growing industry. Uh, I just think that a lot of people who try to get into it uh, go about it the wrong way. And the reason I say that is that, you know, they see someone like Ian Bremmer, or someone like George Friedman or Peter Zion or myself, and they say like, oh, I want to do that. But the issue is that you're looking at the end of the line, you know, like you're looking at the end of the assembly line. And what you should be thinking is how do I enter the assembly line? And the only way to really enter the industry of political or geopolitical risk analysis is to become an expert on something pretty small. Don't think big picture. You know, don't try to become a global strategist on day one. Uh, gain an expertise, especially in parts of the world that are not, you know, interesting right now. So, uh, you know, like learning Mandarin in 2021 is the wrong time, you know, if you're an American student. Um, you know, it, it would be like learning like Arabic in 2011, like bad time to do that. Um, so start thinking about, you know, where the world is going, what matters. Uh, for example, climate change is something that I think is a really big issue. I think that policymakers are reacting to it. And I think that that's going to require um, a level of investment in commodities that we haven't really seen in a while. Um, And we're suddenly going to start caring about things like nickel or cobalt or lithium. And guess what? The good news for someone who's young is that a lot of these things are found in places that no one's really spent any time studying for a very long time. So if you're interested in Latin America or Africa, I think that your time will come. And so, you know, focus on developing an expertise and a skill set in something that's digestible, uh, that you can study. And from there, you can eventually become, um, you know, someone who has a global purview. But thinking that you're going to start off with a global perspective, you know, right out of university or right after a master's even, it's just, it's, it's not feasible. It's not realistic. I mean, as I write in the book, I started off as a Europe analyst, which was about as interesting as being an admiral of a Swiss Navy. You know, I always make fun of myself for that. Um, but it ended up being really fortuitous. I got lucky, the Euro area crisis hit, 
Um, but I developed a competency in something that nobody else really wanted to touch, to be quite frank with you. So I, uh, that would be my advice for a lot of people trying to get into this field. Find a niche. And the niche doesn't have to be geographic. It doesn't require language study necessarily all the time. Uh, it might be something in, you know, uh, in technology that's emerging. It might be something in a policy that's emerging that's cross-regional, cross-country. Uh, but focus on developing an expertise first and then thinking about branching out to more regional and global issues. I love it. We've hit on focus twice. It's one of the most important ideas. Um, Marco, if folks want to learn more about all the work that you're doing, uh, we're going to link to the book um, in the show notes for people if they want to check that out. But any other digital coordinates that you want to provide for folks that want to learn more? Uh, no, I actually don't have any. If I had any advice, it would be stop listening to people like me. <laughs> There's this, you know, like there's this huge obsession with following the right people. Um, ultimately, anything that you get from me in the, in the sort of ether of the internet is going to be um, not really that useful, to be, to be quite honest with you. I think um, focus on learning from yourself. And I think my book was written specifically to empower, you know, mainly investors, but it can be anyone. Um, with this idea that you yourself can do the hard work. So I actually am not available anywhere uh, outside of the book. Uh, all the research that I produce is really for uh, a select group of institutional investors. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and what I would say is like, you know, maybe, maybe whatever, however many people you're following, cut it in half and do more deep reading and deep analysis yourself. I dig that. Can you talk about some of the sources that you go back to most frequently when you're oh, trying a, to get to that ground truth? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Always primary, 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 primary documents. Always. Um, I don't know what they teach in history classes, but it's not how to go to primary documents. Like I can tell, <laughs> you know, like uh, this is key. This is key. You cannot go to a blog post. You cannot go to New York Times. You cannot go to Financial Times. It's not research. It's just not. You know, it's entertainment, first and foremost. The only place where you can find true truth is the primary document. So if you are trying to figure out what's going to happen with the fiscal stimulus in the United States of America, don't go and read what New York Times says about it or Axios or Politico or The Hill, although those are, especially The Hill, very good sources of information. You want to go and actually read the document. And if you're starting out, then, you know, like the reason I really love this podcast, uh, Aaron, and the, the reason I want to do it is because I, I do want to talk to young people trying to get us in this, in this industry. What I would say is like, read less of stuff that's easy to read. Read more of stuff that's really difficult to read. You know what's difficult to read? A bill, <laughs> a con congressional bill, a House or a Senate bill. Like, my God, it's one of the most boring things you can do in your life. But that's where you're going to start, you know, like after you read like five of them, you're going to start seeing like interesting tidbits, interesting knowledge that other people have not picked up. And that's something that a lot of, of my mentors, like my partner here at Clark Tower, Steve Drobny, have, have said. I mean, like, you know, the medium person you're competing with is lazy. And they're not going to do the hard work of going to the primary documents. And so put in the effort to do it. Um, so... How do you collect information? How do you become more aware of what's going on in the world? I would say there's like, there's three levels. One is read the news, uh, you know, just headlines. Uh, I prefer to use Reuters for that or the wire services like AF AFP or AP. Like the, the less analysis there is in the news, the more I like it. I don't need someone to pre-digest the news for me and give it to me in little slices. I just want the actual thing that happened. So that's first. The second is talk to people. Get a group of friends that you really uh, admire. Get people who can, you know, where you can talk out ideas and what's going on in the world, uh, where you can have this iterative dialogue because that's where you're going to get great ideas. So basically you get the news, you hear what happened, you run it through a filter of really important people that you admire, hopefully some that are older, different perspectives, more experienced, whatever the case is. Then you come up with ideas and you pursue those ideas by doing deep, deep knowledge and deep analysis and deep reading. That means academic papers, that means books, and that means primary sources. Uh, when you read academic papers and when you read books, 
read the footnotes. Occasionally, they'll be funny. If you read my book, for example, there'll be many in there that are funny and some that are not. Why do I have funny footnotes? Because I want you to hope that every footnote is worth reading. And most of them are because that's how you get to other sources of information. Uh, some of the best thinking that I've done in my life and some of the things that have made my career were found in footnotes where you read an article about why, an academic piece about why, issue Y, and then you get to issue X because of that footnote and it blows your mind. Um, so that's what I would say. I mean, the question that you are posing, Aaron, I get it a lot. What do you read? And my answer is, I don't read anything that can really be read very quickly. Uh, I don't read any of the things that you would expect, like the economist, foreign affairs, foreign policy, all that stuff is not useful. Um, I think, obviously, if you are, you know, building a company that's doing something specific, where you don't have to be a geopolitical risk strategist, right? Definitely, you should read The Economist. Like, that's my favorite, like, for sure. If it's just something you want to have on your mind, that makes sense. But if you want to do this professionally, what I'm doing, this is the only way to do it. I dig that. Well, part, part of my game is to try to get around really smart people. And I'm not afraid to say something that's probably not correct and let them correct me on it. That's one of the ways I like to go to the source as really? well. Um, but yeah. I, uh, I really, really appreciate you taking so much time to talk with me and, and, oh, and share your stuff with the audience. Um, I, I prepped you for the challenge at the end. I feel like we got a couple here. So if, there, if there's still another challenge that you want to issue to the audience, uh, this is your, your chance on the mic. Yes, definitely. So my whole thing is the hardest part about this job, the toughest part of this job is to really try to be as, as unbiased as possible. And I've tried to do that in my life by surrounding myself by people who I disagree with, you know, on, on some, you know, important issues. Although I, I don't have anyone in my life who's a Clipper fan and I never will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but so what does that mean? What's the challenge? Well, I think there's two parts of the challenge. I think one is try to do what I said. And I mean, this is, this is so important, whether you are, you know, hoping to have a geopolitical risk kind of analysis career or finance career or not. But I think spending time abroad is really useful. Uh, and I know that's been said before, and I'm sure I'm probably not the first or the last who will say that as a challenge, but I would say that uh, right now. I mean, this summer is a really good time spend some time abroad. If you're at a university, do it for sure. Like this is probably the most useful thing you can do at the university. The second thing I would say is, you know, if that's not, it's like too big, like I can't do that tomorrow or this weekend, then do something different. You know, like go to a, like a political meeting or go and talk to someone who is on the ex exact opposite political spectrum from you and spend some time to listen to them and don't really just ask questions, you know, like, spend like as much time as you can just listening. And if you can't find anyone, which would be really sad if you can't, then just watch a TV channel you deeply disagree with for like a week. Make it like almost like a medicine you take before you go to sleep every night. And the reason I say that is because you really need to learn, I think in life, to put yourself in the shoes of those who think differently and act differently than you. Because that act in of itself will make you a much better analyst. Um, I mean, that's, that, that's kind of the core. I mean, my book has a bunch of fancy examples of finance and all this stuff. But fundamentally speaking, if you're going to be in the industry of analyzing politics or geopolitics for a living, you have to be able to have a baseline level that's analytical and in order to, you know, produce outcomes and produce forecasts. Then you can, you know, what you do with that is obviously uh, what you want. You can change the world with that. You can be extremely non-nihilist with it. But the analysis itself has to be done from that baseline level of a loop indifference. And it's impossible to do that unless um, you practice. Right on. Well, hopefully uh, many listeners will take the challenge, practice it, and we'll have a bunch more nihilists walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily nihilist, just analytically nihilist. But then what you do with that, please, I'm not trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just joshing. Yeah. Um, Marco, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Okay, awesome. Thank you for the opportunity, Aaron. And I hope that, um, you know, I hope it was helpful. It absolutely was. We just went deep with Marco Popic. Hope everyone out there has a fantastic day.
Thanks for watching to the end of my interview with Marco. If you enjoyed this, I'm highly confident that you will enjoy our recent past interview with Mike Green. Mike is also a high level financial thinker, has very pointed opinions on index funds and Bitcoin. Check out that interview and let me know what you think in the comments.